So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to attend my, my talk. My name is Jun, and I'm from Pennsylvania State University. I'm a fourth year PhD student. Today, I would like to talk about my work on analysis of code dump generated by memory corruption. Our ultimate goal is to locate the code area where memory corruption occurs. This work is under the supervision of Dr. Peng Liu and Dr. Xin Yuxin from Penn State University. Nowadays, even though a lot of efforts have been put on code review and testing, software inevitably contains defects. Once in a while, this defect will be triggered and your program will crash. No matter you're using Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. When your program crashes, some abnormal events must have happened. In fact, there is a set of events which may lead to crash of your, of your programs. For instance, when the illegal instruction is executed, your CPU will be interrupted and your program will crash. When the invalid memory is referenced, page, uh, segmentation faults will arise and your program will, will be crashed. When your program receives a both signal, the program will also crash. So when your program crashes, you probably want to, to know why and how. And you would be wondering if there is anything we can leverage to do post molten analysis. The answer is yes. So when a crash event occurs, the operating system will generate a snapshot of the crashing program. The snapshot basically can include information such as registers, memories, and other things like a signal the program received. The snapshot is organized as a file on your disk, which is typically called a call dump. The call dump actually provides a lot of useful information for post-mortem program analysis. Let's see, uh, sorry. So in our presentation, a call dump will look like this. So when you see a blue picture, it's a call dump. And now let's see an example here. In this example, in the program, the main function calls function child, and in the function child, a non-pointer is assigned. Then the non-pointer is passed to another function, which is called crush. In the function crush, the non-pointer is dereferenced, and the program crushed, which generates a call dump like this. This type of call dump contains a lot of information. For instance, it covers the crush point which shows in which instruction the program crashed. With, the, with this set of information, previous research works, such as Retracer from, by, by Wei Dong from Microsoft, could do some backtrace, and their backtrace until the root cause of the crash, namely the assignment of non-pointer in this case. However, in this case, the crash is due to the reference of non-pointer and all the information in the call dump is complete. However, it's not always the case. When the crash is due to security-related defects, in particular, memory corruption. Post-mortem program, program analysis could be pretty challenging. At first, I would like to introduce the concept of memory corruption briefly. So, by definition, memory corruption means contents of a memory location are unintentionally modified due to programming errors. Common types of memory corruption include stack overflow, heap overflow, and user after free. Memory corruption actually introduced a lot of new challenges for post-mortem program analysis. Corruption could corrupt the control flow and conceal the actual crash point. As such, we have no starting points to go as the corruption may also pollute data on the stack. The stack frames may have been corrupted. Then we don't know how the execution was proceeded before the crash. And in addition, the data maintained in the core dump may have also been broken. So approaches while backtracing back may not be reliable anymore. In conclusion, memory corruption Makes it, makes it very challenging to employ previous solutions to do post-mortem analysis on crush. Uh, let's see an example here. Sorry. 
in the program of this example, the main function calls function crush. In the function crush, a buffer overflow, a stack buffer overflow happened. And uh, before the overflow, the stack looks like this. Everything, every information on the stack is complete and clean. However, after the overflow happens, all the data above the buffer are corrupted. And uh, the return address of the currently executed function, namely crash, is also corrupted. When the function returns the program crash, generate, generate a call dump like this. This type, of, this type of call dump actually contains little information, except the crash event. We don't have the crash point, we don't have the stack frames, we cannot ensure the, the, the integrity of data in the call dump. So it's introduced a lot of uh, challenges for post-mortem analysis. To the best of our knowledge, there is no previous work focusing on post-mortem analysis based on, uh, based on call dump with corrupted memory. We are thus motivated to perform forensics on call dump with corrupted data, and our ultimate goal is to locate the code area where the corruption happens. So our approach takes three inputs. First, call dump with corrupted data. Second, we require binary with debug information. Third, we require the existing of source code. And our output, as I explained before, we, need, we, we want to output the code fragment where the memory corruption occurs. And to achieve our goal, we have to do three things. First, when the crash point is missing, we need to track down the crash point. So basically, when the crash point is missing, it is highly possible that the target of an indirect jump has been corrupted. When the indirect jump was executed, the program crashed. So in these cases, to locate the crash point, we need to pinpoint that indirect jump. Our approach consists of two steps. In the first step, we scan the stack and find the recently returned functions. Specifically, we scan the stack below the current stack pointer, and we are trying to find return addresses. For a found return address, we validate its legitimacy following two criteria. First, the instruction at the return address must be legal. Second, the instruction at the return address must follow a call instruction. So when we found a return address, we proceed to the second step. We return to the code and scan the code from the return side to find the first following indirect jump. And then we check if this indirect jump is the crash point we want. To do the check, we set up a set of verifications. For instance, we check if the target of the, indirect, of the first indirect jump matches the program counter maintained in the call dump. And we will also check the position of the stack pointer, whether it is located in the expected location. We will also do other checks. I will skip the details. So if this set of verification are good, then we conclude the first indirect jump after our return function is the crash point. In our overflow example, the most recent return function is bar. And the return statement at line 13 is actually the crash point. So after we have tracked down the, the crash point, we will update the, the corrupted program count in the call dump to the correct value. And the next, we will try to identify stack frames. Technically speaking, our approach is pretty simple. We leverage call frame information, which is a part of debugging information, and we leverage register and memories in the call dump to do the stack frame, uh, to, to identify the stack frames. We do not propose new solutions to enhance identification. Instead, we add a set of verifications to during the, identifica during the identification because the register and the memories in the call dump may, have, may contain corrupted data. 
So, for for example, when, uh, whenever we identify, identify, whenever we identify a frame, we will check the legitimacy of the frame location. The frame, the frame of a of a child function must follow must locate below the frame of a parent function, and we also check the legitimacy of the return address in each identified frame, following the two criteria I stated before. And we also do some other checks. Why? So for, for each identified stack frame, if all those verifications are good, we will say this frame is a legitimate frame. Otherwise, we will stop our identification of stack frames. Even though tracking down the crash point and identification of stack frames already provide a lot of information for debugging, we want to contribute more, and we want to achieve our ultimate goal. We want to determine the quality data objects in the call down, and we also want to find out the code fragment where the memory corruption occurs. Technically speaking, the insights, the insights of our approach is not complicated. We check the inconsistency between two things. The first thing is the definition of data objects in the crushing program. The, the second thing is the values maintained in the call dump. Specifically, if the value of a data object observed in the call dump does not match any possible definition in the program, the objects must have been corrupted. Let's see how I did it. How I did it. At first, we will construct a partial inter-procedure control flow based on the stack frames we identified. The control flow graph only covers code that may have been executed based on the stack frames we identified. For, in that, for, for instance, in, the, in, in our overflow example, we only construct the control flow for the crash function because we can only identify the frame for the, for, for the crash function. And then we will perform a value set analysis to obtain the set of possible values of a data object during normal execution. Our value set analysis consists of two procedures. The first, in the first procedure, we will perform point two analysis to identify the set of pointers that may point to one specific variable. In the se second procedure, we will perform a reaching definition analysis, which will collect all the possible definition of one variable that may reach the crash point. For example, in our overflow example, the local variable A contains two definitions. The first one is at line eight. The other one is at line nine. And uh, we can collect the value sets for local variable A contains 0 and 1. After we obtain the value sets of a data objects, we will do our last step, value check. So how we do the value check? We extract the value of an object from the call dump, and we check if the value in the call dump falls into the value sets we analyzed. If it's not, then the data objects must have been unintentionally modified, namely corrupted. For example, here. In this example, A, have two, A has two normal definitions, I mean legal definitions. And the value set for A con consists of 0 and 1. However, in the call dump, the value of A equals to 65. Obviously, the value of A in the call dump falls out of the value set. So, we conclude that A is a corrupted data object. Well, when, whenever we identify the corrupted data objects, do we know where, where the corruption occurs? Yes. In the value set of, of a corrupted data object, each value actually corresponding to a definition that may reach the crash point. For the definition to reach the crash point, it may go through a piece of code, and we call, we call that piece of code as covered by the definition. For example, here, 
for the local variable A, we have a definition at line eight. For this definition to reach the crash point at line 13, the return, it's needed to go through 9, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So this is the co code piece covered by A equals to zero, the definition at line eight. And for the definition at 9, 9, it's all, it also covers a code piece. We aggregate the two code pieces to form the final, the final result of our determination. This union result is the code area we conclude as well memory corruption occurs. So that basically summarizes the three steps we did to achieve our goal. To evaluate the utilities of our approach, we need to do some case studies. But before presenting the, the study results, I would like to show some questions we ask ourselves bef when we do the experiment. Question one is, can we really find the corrupted data objects? So if we can find the corrupted data objects, can we find the corresponding corruption fragments, code fragments? And if we can find the, co the corruption fragments, how large? is the average, average fragment size. Even if we can do all the things and the size of the average fragment is pretty small, we have to ask the final question. Do we have any false positive? To answer these questions, we did a set of case studies. We collected a set of vulnerable program and the corresponding POC from Security Exploits database and we successfully produced 80 crashes using the POCs. The 80 crashes are corresponding to 73 memory corruption vulnerabilities. And in result, we can track down all the crash points except in one case, and I will explain this case later. For 63 crashes, we successfully identified corrupted data objects and corresponding code areas. The average line of code in the area we determined is about 46, which covers about 3.5 functions on average. And uh, because we're conservative, there is no false positive. In our paper, we presented a full table contains the information of all the 80 cases. So this table actually contains some inf interesting information, such as the lines of code in the area we determined. If you are interested in this table, please refer to our, our paper. Here, I would like to share some interesting cases that our approach could not work out. So in the example of CompFace, we were unable to track down the crash point. The reason behind this is that there is no function called before the crash. So we could not identify the indirect jump that lead to the crash. In some other cases, we were unable to determine, determine any corrupted data objects. In the example of ProFTBD and VFU, the corruption was on local variables that were reassigned before crash. This means the value of this this object in the call dump actually fall into the value sets we obtain. In the example of two fox and y2, the data corruption occurs to objects that have not been initialized before the crash. Into, uh, implication behind this is that during our value set analysis, the value set, an the value set is actually empty. So we cannot perform the the value check in the last step. In the example of Clam V, the crash occurs in advance of data corruption. Basically, there is no corruption. In conclusion, our work enables post-mortem program analysis based on code dump, even though memory corruption may have happened and the data in the code dump may have been corrupted. Based on our case studies, our approach accurately and reliably provides information for diagnosing software defects, in particular memory corruption. And our approach could downside the code space that the analysts 
or developers need to manually and egg them. So this is my talk. Thanks very much. And uh, I will open my code and all the studied cases recently. Thank you. Do we have any questions from uh, the audience? Please come to the microphone. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, Jesse Lass, United States Military Academy. Uh, in your example, you demonstrated a very simple buffer overflow. What was the, the complexity of the types of uh, bugs that you were able to, to perform analysis on? Uh, in our case study, our cases include stack overflow, heap overflow, and use after free. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I'm curious if um, you could use any particular type of buffer to analyze the performance of your code. So, for instance, when a program crashes, um, you could run it until slightly before it crashed, mm -hmm. if you knew how many instructions it ran or whatever, and then look at the core dump from that case. Could you gain any additional information in that way? Uh, excuse me, because I didn't hear you. Yeah, is this microphone? Yeah, this is on now. Um, so. If you know, for instance, that a program crashes after n instructions, mm -hmm. if you can rerun it, why not just run it for n minus 1,000 instructions mm -hmm. and get a different core dump, not, not, a, not a core dump, but get, get a different process image and compare that with the actual core dump? Could you get any extra information that way? Um, yes, if you have the input. If you have the corresponding input, you can rerun the program and generate the instruction traces. But in our work, we'll assume, we'll assume there is no input. So I guess that my, my broader question is, I assume that this is going to be used by people who receive a crash, mm -hmm. and they're trying to hunt it down, they're the developers or something like that. Mm -hmm. So potentially they only have a core dump, but potentially they have an actual reproducible input. So I'm just wondering if you can find the crash any faster if you have the reproducible input. Mm -hmm. I guess our work is still work could work on the case you mentioned. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker one more time.